I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. In the previous podcast I told you that according to many Bible historians, the three short letters of John are possibly the last of the New Testament to be written and perhaps are the last words we have from any of the apostles. I also suggested that the last verse of 1 John might be God's last word to mankind. God's first statement to us in Genesis was, In the beginning God created, and among his last words to us as translated in the Living Bible was, Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. The letters of John focus on that statement in 1 John 5 verses 21. He warns all believers to keep away from anything that might replace God in their lives. Anything that replaces God in our lives is idolatry, pure and simple. And it is still the greatest threat to all of us who call ourselves believers. The second letter of John is the only letter in the New Testament addressed to a woman. It is addressed to the chosen lady and her children. There are two theories as to who or what this term refers to. This could either have been a lady of some importance in the church or else a code which refers to the local church and its congregation. In those days when Christians were being persecuted, such coded salutations were often used. This might also be the reason why John probably did not name himself or call the elect lady or her children by name. He probably didn't want to implicate anyone by name in the written letter. If the letter was intercepted and the authorities knew who it was written to, it might mean death for those persons. If we look at the letter as if it was written to a lady within the church, we can assume that it was probably written to a mother with several children, perhaps a widow. She had written to the Apostle John to ask his opinion about certain problems that she had encountered. What is important is to always keep in the back of your mind whenever you read the Bible is that the New Testament was not available to these people as it is to us today. During the first two centuries, the gospel was taken from place to place by traveling evangelists and teachers. It was customary for believers to take these missionaries into their homes and give them provisions for their journey when they left. Gnostic teachers also relied on this practice. And so we can be pretty certain that 2 John was written by the old apostle to encourage discernment when supporting traveling teachers. Otherwise, someone might have unintentionally contributed to the spreading of heresy rather than the truth. Evidently, some of these Gnostic teachers had come to the home of this woman, who probably lived in the city of Ephesus, and they told her certain things about the Christian doctrine that disturbed her. We can gather from the evidence in 2 John that they did not agree that Christ became a real man. They taught that the Christ did not really die for us. They said that Jesus died as a man and not as Christ. And they denied the truth that Jesus is Christ, the Son of God. Not knowing quite what to do, she wrote a letter to the Apostle John and asked for his advice. The letter of 2 John is his response to her questions. It is extremely important for us today that we check everything we see, hear and read that claims to be Christian with the scriptures. I cannot emphasize this more strongly. One of Satan's greatest weapons that he uses against believers is deceit. It is very easy to be taken in by a new and exciting revelation that appears to be based on scripture but which, if examined closely, is in fact a departure from the word of God. If what appears to be truth does not line up explicitly with Scripture, then it is false and not of the Spirit, and John says we should have nothing to do with it. Even though Second John is one of the shortest letters in the New Testament and can be read in a few minutes, if you pause to consider the content, you will hopefully see how it also answers many of the questions we have today, especially how to treat people who teach wrong things. The first six verses present the problem to us and give John's approach in answering it. From the elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, 
as indeed in addition to myself, do all those who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and is with us for ever. Grace, mercy and peace from God the Father and from Jesus the Messiah, the Son of the Father, be with us in truth and love. I was delighted when I found some of your children walking in the truth, just as we received the commandment from the Father. And now, dear lady, I ask you, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we had from the very beginning, that we should love one another. This is love, that we should behave in accordance with his commandments. And this is the commandment, just as you heard it from the very start, that we should behave in accordance with it. As I mentioned earlier, John does not give his name at the beginning and merely refers to himself as the Elder, because this was the time when persecution was a real possibility. The letter is addressed in such a way to stump any hostile person who might intercept the letter, and it was this obscuring of the author and the person to whom it was written that causes this letter to be regarded as not being penned by the Apostle John. It was the same John that wrote the Gospel of John, the three epistles of John, and the book of Revelation. In the first six verses of Second John, the Apostle lays a foundation for the answer to this lady's problem. He defines two things that must be taken into consideration in facing a problem of this kind. There are two specific words that feature all through the text. These words are firstly truth, and secondly, love. They are linked in 2 John 1 verses 3. Grace, mercy and peace will be with us, from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. These two characteristics ought to be discernible in all Christians. Paul says the same in his letter to the Ephesians in chapter 4 verses 14 to 15. So that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. The remarkable work of the Holy Spirit in any believer's life is to bring these often opposing aspects together and keep them in perfect balance. This was a problem at the time when John wrote this letter, and it is still our problem today as well. So many of us emphasize one at the expense of the other. Zane C. Hodges said in his book about the epistles of John that, when divorced from truth, love is little more than sentimentality or humanism. If I truly care about my brothers, then I will want them to know and live according to God's truth. There are many of us who fall into the trap of emphasizing love at the expense of truth. We feel that we should accept everyone and everything, and be tolerant and accommodate all things, out of fear of driving people away or making waves. This is a byproduct, in my opinion, of the humanist philosophy of relativism, where nothing is true or false, and everything is just an opinion. On the other hand, we might also emphasize truth and focus upon doctrinal matters and insist that the scriptures be followed carefully, and do it at the expense of love. If we do this, we run the risk of being cold, rigid and judgmental, and sometimes even cruel, especially in the way we say things. Even though what we are saying is 100% correct, we risk defending the truth of God at the expense of love. It is always a problem to keep truth and love in balance, but we will always have the Lord Jesus as a perfect example of how to walk in truth and love. Jesus would deal tenderly with a wayward sinner, a reject of society who came to him. Just think of the way he dealt tenderly with the woman that had been caught in adultery and who had been brought before him by the scribes and Pharisees who wanted to stone her to death. This can be found in John's Gospel, chapter 8. There he said to her, Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Yet, in the same passage, he dealt firmly and truthfully with the religious leaders, 
sending them away red-faced with shame as he exposed all the rottenness of their inner life by declaring, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus spoke the truth, and he dealt in love, and he always kept them in perfect balance. When we look back at Second John 1 verses 3, it says, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, and from Jesus the Messiah, the Son of the Father, be with us in truth and love. The Apostle is saying, Whenever you handle a problem of doctrinal error, do what Jesus did. Emphasize both truth and love. When I started preparing for this podcast and was reading through the letter, I also missed these opening words and I missed the careful balance that can be found throughout this letter. In verses 7 to 11, we have the answer to the lady's question. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Firstly, you have to recognize the nature of the error. Two things are said in these verses that describe the basic types of Christian heresy. There are only two, and all Christian heterodoxy is based on one or the other of these errors. Firstly, there are those people who are deceived about the person of Jesus Christ. There is one clear sign of the true Redeemer and Saviour. He would be the one who came from God into the world and became man. The Incarnation is an essential doctrine of Christian faith. It is that act of grace whereby Christ took our human nature into union with his divine person and became man. If you can trace a man's origin from his birth and you know that he entered this world through the normal reproductive process and he claims to be a saviour, you can write it off because he is not God's saviour. And if he claims to not believe nor to accept the incarnation of the Lord Jesus, then the man is in error. No matter what else he may say, he is not a spokesman of God. All through the New Testament letters, the apostles of Jesus set his incarnation at the center point of Christian theology. The Word Becoming Man Everything else builds out from that, the person of the Lord Jesus. John is declaring that if a man does not say that, no matter what else he may say, he is a deceiver. Now, he may be deceived, as well as being a deceiver, but he is an antichrist. He is against the doctrine of Jesus, and he is in place of Jesus. Therefore, he has to be recognized for what he is, a man who is mistaken and is trying to deceive others. The second type of error occurs when there is a misunderstanding or false conception of the teaching of the Lord Jesus. 2 John chapter 1 verses 9 says, Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The Greek word for the phrase goes on ahead is proagon, which means literally one who goes too far. Hopefully you will see how revealing this Greek word is. To the so-called Christian groups that declare that the Bible is not the complete revelation of God and that we need something else, something more, something new, have gone too far. Someone with such a view might be very persuasive and very sincere and might have a very charismatic personality, but this is the test. If this person does not abide within the doctrine and teachings of Christ, then he is not of God. There are many people today who say that the Bible is no longer relevant. They maintain that modern man has grown beyond all this and no longer needs these primitive teachings of Scripture. Instead, they feel that science has left the Bible behind. This is exactly what John is talking about here. Someone who goes beyond, who goes too far and departs from the revelation of Jesus, 
believing it to be too simple, and then tries to add something to the teachings of the Word of God. Gnostic heresy maintains that salvation cannot be obtained by faith in Christ alone, but by special knowledge. By the way, the Greek word for knowledge is gnosis. So, Gnosticism literally means having knowledge. So these are the two types of error. Firstly, to be deceived about the person of Jesus Christ, and secondly, having a false conception of the teachings of Jesus Christ. So, what is the danger to us if we fall into these sorts of error? 2 John 1 verses 8 gives the answer. Watch yourselves, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. What do we lose as a believer when we get involved with cults and heresies and liberal approaches that are so widespread today? Will we lose our salvation? Not if we are really born again. That rests upon the work of Christ for us. Remember what Paul tells us in his letter to the Ephesians chapter 2. God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. We are not going to lose our place in heaven, or our redemption, but we risk losing a great deal, and John makes it very clear. We risk losing the value of our lives spent here, we waste our time. We cast away our time, involved in that which is utterly worthless, that which will be shown up in the end as wood, grass or straw, which will be consumed in the fire of God's judgment, and we will lose our reward. 1 Corinthians 3 verses 1 to 5 says this, According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Throughout the New Testament, this danger is made very clear. In Revelation 3 verses 11, John says the following to the church in Philadelphia, Hold on to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. The crown spoken of here is a symbol of the authority and the honor. This is given to those who have made themselves available to the work of God, those who have given their bodies as a living sacrifice for God to work through. Remember what we just read in Ephesians chapter 2. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. If we throw away our time on something that is grounded upon false teaching, all our efforts will be wasted. All we will be building is a fancy facade. It might look very good and impressive from the front, but at the end it will be destroyed and will find no value before God. I'm sure the next question that pops into your head was the same question that this lady that John was writing to had. What do we do when we encounter people like this? John's answer is found in 2 John 1 verses 10 to 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house, or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Always remember what John had said previously about truth and love. It is so easy for those of us who are concerned about the doctrines of Scripture 
to forsake the courtesy and kindness that is expected of every Christian. Do we interpret this message to mean that we are to slam the door in the face of anyone who offers us some of these heretical ideas? Should we kick them out of our house the minute they bring up some kind of heretical teaching? If this is what John means, then when we discover that someone is not a Christian, we are not supposed to let them into our houses. We could never extend our friendship to those of another religion who might be visiting in our country. We might be acting in defense of the truth, but we would not be manifesting anything of the love and mercy that God granted us through His grace towards them. John means here that truth should be uttered in love, and love should be enclosed by truth. In other words, we are not to receive these people in such a way that we are then validating or accepting their teaching. In the days when John wrote his letters, hotels did not exist, and inns were very few and far between. When these teachers travelled, they always stayed in private homes. So when they entered a home bringing false teaching, and that person continued to open his home to them, he would be endorsing their false doctrine. But John did not say that the host should not be courteous, or help in some sort of emergency. The parable of the Good Samaritan makes it very clear that if someone is in need, it does not make any difference who he is, we are to help him. We should be treating these people graciously, thoughtfully, kindly, as any fellow human being, but not to endorse or support their wrong ideas. We are not to share in their wicked works, and this is what John is saying here. I remember we hosted a Bible study in our home many years ago, and for a few weeks we had a visitor who was touting some very dodgy theology, typical of what we might find in the current Word of Faith movement. It was very uncomfortable for us all to have her sharing her aberrant views with us, and we would have preferred not to allow her into our house at all. We chose, however, to deal with it as best as we could, and let her speak and then listen to her without interrupting or criticizing, but afterwards we answered her arguments directly from the scriptures. She left after a few weeks, never to be seen again, but I truly believe that she left not because she felt unwelcome or unloved, but that her truth and ours had no common ground. Second John 1 verses 12 to 13 ends the letter. John was a prolific writer. He wrote the Gospel of John, his three epistles, and the book of Revelation. Altogether, the Apostle John authored 50 of the New Testament's 260 chapters, so he certainly could have written a longer letter, but this was not his intention here. It seems John always preferred personal contact. He uses a Greek phrase that is translated as face-to-face. -face. The Greek is stoma pro stoma, which literally means mouth-to-mouth. -mouth. The image that this phrase depicts is two people directly communicating with each other without any barriers or distance. It means to speak in person directly. Personal visits always have a greater value and a different feel to communication over a distance. Having the opportunity to meet face to face would have made John extremely happy. 2 John 1 verses 12 says, Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face, so that our joy may be complete. I'm certain that the reason for the letter was so important that he still took time to write it. John finishes off the letter by sending greetings from the Christian family that he was evidently staying with, and so he reminds us all of the need in Christian life for both truth and love. Let me finish off this Bible study and podcast with a reading out of the last letter that Paul penned. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 24 and 25 says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. I don't think it could have been said any better. Thank you, Paul. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast. Episode 14